Pera o ki rā te ukaro te rangi, te tukutuku o te rangi, te heihei o te rangi, te mamangi o te rangi, e rongo purutia ki au, purutia ki amo. Purutia tātou ngā kōrero a kui mā a koro mā, hei wānanga mā tātou. Purutia rā ngā wawatau ngā mokopuna, kia pupu ake te ngā kauma ake, kia pupu ake, te ngā kau tūmaia a tēnā, a tēnā o tātou, mo tēnei ko papa, whakahirahira. E mihi tēnei mokopuna o Taranaki maunga, o te aroa anō hoki, ngā mau te reo Samoa, ki a koe, ki a koutou i tēnei rā. Nau mai, hara mai. Hara mai rā ki tēnei kaupapa o he waka e kenoa, he kaupapa rangahau, he kaupapa whakatairanga a tātou tirohanga nā ete i o ngā tino waine, ete i o ngā tino mā reikura o te ao rangahau, o te ao kaupapa Māori i tuku ki a tātou. Nau mai, nau mai, hara mai rā. Uh, Ite Fano, we are so fortunate to be able to have the opportunity to come together to share, to listen, and to ask partai of our Mare Kura in this in this webinar series, who have been working on this Mai Rangaho for some years, some of them for some uh, decades in their career. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to be with you and to support the organisations who have supported this research. And they are Te Aratupu, Puranga Kura, Te Wharuwānanga o Awanui Ārangi, Te Puna Ōranga, Te Atawhai o Te Ao, Māori and Indigenous Analysis Limited, Kākāriki Consulting Limited, Te Rau Aroha, Lalanga Training and Consultancy, and last but definitely not least, Tū Tama Wahine o Taranaki, who are our hosts today. Ko Hine Rangi Edwards tōku ingoa. My name is Hine Rangi Edwards uh, and I'm a director of Ātea, uh, a kaupapa Māori uh, pākehi uh, that is here and very honoured to support this kaupapa. Uh, e te whānau, just some notes, housekeeping notes. Um, this is a webinar environment which might feel a little different that you cannot see um, uh, everyone on the call. Uh, and the reason why is because actually uh, our kaupapa, we, we would really like to um, ensure our kai kōrero can kōrero without all of our background noises. That's one of the key things. But also um, so that you can you can explore and be with yourself in, as you listen to the kōrero. Uh, you're able to share pātai using the question and answer function. So when you go down to the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, press on that and you'll come up with that little box that you can see um, in front of you right now. If you um, unclick the send anonymously, it means that um, our presenter um, can, can know um, where the corded or where the partai has come from. Our webinar is being recorded today to enable this Rauimi um, to be shared with you um, so that you can re-listen to this corded or, or share it with others that you believe um, will gain value and um, I can't think of anyone actually who wouldn't get, gain value listening to this corded or last week's webinar um, a series of three workshops uh, are already online on the Tutama Wahine website so um, please please um, partake in this in this pātaka corded or uh, for some of you, we might um, you might find that this cortisol um, uh, can create or stimulate some responses or some energies. Our last session, um, I messaged um, Professor Leone Pihama afterwards and said, "My kamo a leaking," which is, means the ititangi, ititangi te aroha. Um, it wasn't the podi or any trauma that was experienced, but it was actually the release that she shared um, in her last session. It was the rongoa um, taking, taking account and enabling um, my Modi uh, to uh, be at peace. So for those of you who experience whatever that you're experiencing, 
please open the window, get some fresh air in, drink some water, but also we have these kaupapa here that you can, um, which are on your screen right now, that you can reach out to or anyone that you feel um, gives you that, that nourishment and that, that safety to one of it. Uh, I think that's all of our housekeeping at the moment, Ete Wano. Oh, one last thing. When kairangaho share their kōrero, it's easy for us to feel um, um, invibed and connecting, connected to it, and it can stimulate our own rangaho. We just ask, um, and it's not the kairangaho who are asking this, I ask you um, to, to please whakaro, me, me whakaro tato, um, honour the kai kōrero, or honour those um, puna where the kōrero has come from. That enables other people to find the whakapapa to the kōrero and then go to that puna. Um, and um, that's perhaps a beautiful way of saying, um, yeah, whakamana te kupu, whakamana hoki te puna, nā wai te, te, uh, te kupu i puta. Um, and now it's my honour to uh, introduce Professor Linda Tuhiwai-Smith, um, Kwai Linda was with us last week, and um, I have to say the put, the partai that came through uh, in the session um, showed us um, the depth that people received from her and the responses that came um, uh, back in as a as a partai or as a statement. Linda, uh, Linda is a distinguished professor of Te Whare Wānanga or Awanui Arangi. She's a researcher, mentor, supervisor, writer, and educator. A nanny as well. Linda is renowned for her work in Indigenous um, Māori education, decolonising methodologies, and uh, Kopapa Māori. Her book, Decolonising Methodologies Research in Indigenous Peoples, has been an international bestseller in the Indigenous world since its publication in 1998. Fai Linda also shared with us last week that she has been a pr practitioner um, in the Kopapa that we are sharing today. Uh, Nareira, um, E te rangatira, uh, no mātou te whiwhi, te noho ki wainga uh, ki, ki e nei kōrero i tēnei wā. Um, and fire before you start, um, there was a pātai. Um, some of the feedback from our um, kōrero last week was, wow, a kupu Māori are beautiful and we we understand the whakamārama. Some of the kupu pākeha uh, some of the things that we're going, hmm, what does that actually mean? And are we interpret interpreting it correctly? So we just had a part time, if you might, as you caught it all today, to also share with us a definition of colonization or decolonizing, um, because we are concerned that people are using those words and um, they, they, they're going a bit kōtiti. So, <laughs> katika ki a koe, tēnā koe. Tēnā koutou katoa. It's Friday afternoon, but there was some good news just a while ago, eh? Uh, with the uh, election results, um, Te Pāti Māori gained two more seats, and I see that the Greens gained one seat, and that will be another Māori member um, of Parliament. It's a good news story in the face of a really bad news story in terms of the next government. And I've been thinking about that all week in terms of the lessons um, from our research and all the work that a whole lot of other people and many of you, you know, I'm just going to assume if you're practitioners and other researchers have been doing this work for years, uh, we have our work cut out for us, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the second half um, of my talk. So seeing that, that it is Friday afternoon, and I just firstly want to mihi to all of you for joining, coming on um, this webinar, and hanging in there. My kaupapa today is really... Uh, in, you know, further around the solutions and in particular um, the our rangatiratanga and um, how that should drive um, our solutions. Uh, I heard the question that Hinerangi asked, so we'll delve a, 
um, more into the, how I use the word decolonizing and decolonization, why I think that's important um, and why I think it's different from other terms that get used, um, like indigenization, for example, is another term. This time, I have tried to incorporate some images, which I've, I think all of them are photos that I've taken. Um, just when you get the PowerPoint later, if you can just respect those images, thank you. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay, so first I want to acknowledge um, uh, Rehi Tanana and uh, Professor Le Leone Pihama, our earlier speakers, and um, for just this, hopefully what you're getting the sense of is the depth and the breadth um, of the work that has been done in He Waka e Kenoa, um, and the, the critical importance I think of our own concepts, our own ideas, as we move into, you know, how does this research make a difference? How can we be transformational? Not just in the way we think about these things, but in the way we push for policy changes, in the way practice changes, in the way providers might change, in the way that as far no as uh, collectives, we might also address some of these changes uh, within us. I think it's really important to see um, the concept of rangatiratanga and the concept of decolonizing, which I'm going to address shortly, as sort of a theories of change, theories of um, sort of systemic change in particular, of and having a view of what is it we're trying to change. I think that's going to be really important over the next um, three years. And when I, you know, when I look back on my career, um, you know, there, there are a couple of things I think we can all feel really amazed at, uh, right? So for example, we get into parliament, um, a young woman who really is from our kohanga reo generation. And that's a 30 year, more than 30 year journey of transformation. And it's a transformation that was driven by Māori, right? Driven by Māori. It's really important to hold those ideas that we can make change. We can define our visions, we can implement our visions, and we can do that through our own consistency, through the way we negotiate, through the way we use um, the mechanisms that we have, but also our own social processes. I think first and foremost, what's always important is we believe in ourselves. And when I think of the beginning of Kohanga Reo and, and especially the beginning of Kura Kaupapa Māori, which I was part of that beginning, you know, people didn't rate us. They didn't give us one hope in hell that parents, you know, mostly mamas with babies um, who wanted something different for their tamariki would end up changing legislation and creating a kura across Aotearoa that has now produced, you know, several generations of um, young people who are fluent in, in te reo, grounded in tikanga and their identity, and who are out there doing amazing things. So that sort of belief that we can change our world and having some theories of change that help us do that so we don't lose faith. We don't um, go round and round in circles. We don't sort of 
get distracted and go over here because someone suggested we do that and go over there because, you know, someone else suggested. So we set a course. And I guess that He Waka Ekendoa also kind of invokes that, right? We're on a, um, a waka. We don't really want to be going round and round in a whirlpool. We want to set a course. Um, and in our waka are some resources that we need. And that's really uh, what I want to talk about today. So I guess the contents of my talk are focusing on these key ideas and thinking of them at the solution end of the way they've been framed. So not just as a way of um, analysing what has gone wrong, and definitely these are useful for doing that, but also seeing through how they can help us make a difference, how they can help resolve and solve issues, how they can drive deeper and more systemic or system change. So I think the three key terms, and this is in one of our chapters of the report, which will be coming out, is Rangatiratanga as a solution, decolonizing as a solution, and Kopapa Māori approaches as solutions. And they do all fit well together. So from, um, there's a statement in this particular chapter which says that transforming family violence and its impact on Māori lies within the aspirations of our people to assert rangatiratanga and mana motuhake over our collective lives. Rangatiratanga and mana motuhake are key concepts that embody aspirations and practices of self-determination and sovereignty. Both terms relate to Māori as collectives. So I just want to dwell on this slide for a bit, have you break it down while you're looking at it. I'll speak a little bit to the photos. I speak probably most of today trying to find suitable um, photos. So what I've chosen are my Fano hapu photos from um, the East Coast, from uh, my hapu of Ngāti Rangi and Repurua Marae and my walker Milna Fano from Tutumatai uh, across the Waiapu Awa um, going towards Tiki Tiki. So um, there we are in our purple uh, for power wars. And it's interesting thinking about the even the term power wars as a celebration of well-being, of being a collective, of belonging to something greater than our whānau, um, but also, you know, a, a unit that can come together. And we generally come together, um, you know, it is the marae that is the central part of a hapū, uh, but it is also the memories of our grandparents, our tipuna, um, you know, our aunties and uncles who genuinely grew up in hapu, not just in Fano households. They genuinely grew up in hapu, and there were multiple strategies that kept those hapu ties really close. So, for example, my aunties and my mum were sent to stay with other whānau who were, with whom we were related. It was kind of a mixed bag thing uh, because I know they, they missed being at home. Uh, but what it did is tie them to these other families, other whānau, uh, in our hapū and in other hapū with whom uh, we're also related. 
also at the hapu level, it's a bit of competition, right, in power wars. And there's nothing wrong with a bit of uh, competition. It, it brings out uh, certain qualities of us. And while we're, you know, while we sort of claim sometimes we're, we're collaborative, um, you know, we work together, et cetera, a common mission often what ties us together is, you know, we're competing for resources or we're com competing for glory or for mana in a particular case. But we're also enjoying doing that. Uh, we're having fun together. And I love observing the way Fano organise around these things. The biggest event at the Ngāti Pro Power Wars is the um, tug of war at the end of the day. And our hapu is too small, really, to pull that one off. Uh, because we've gone in as as a single sort of marae. But, you know, these are really contemporary social practices that different iwi and different hapu, different marae engage in to keep well and to keep connected. The middle photo is actually a whānau photo of just one group, um, one skein on my mother's side, at our homestead, uh, on the back wall there are some photos of our um, aunties, my mum, um, our grandparents. We've lost that entire generation now of my mum's generation. And so, you know, my generation are the next lot of old people who get in the way. Um, and there, there are some of us there um, relaxing really at the end of a tangihana. But once again, it's this broad concept of whānau, um, of, of being able to sit together, support each other um, in good times um, and times that are not so good. And then on the right is just, you know, one of the, those activities that when you have a lot of mouths, you need a lot of kai. And there are a lot of tikanga around kai that also hold us together and keep us firm. What does this have to do with mana motuhake and rangatiratanga? It's the building blocks of our self-belief, of our rangatiratanga as Fano and hapu first and foremost, all right? Because we don't have those. Um, we can't claim to have it at the sort of greater level or the more collective level. Every person, every individual, as well as every Fano, you know, have to um, sort of think about ourselves as these tangatira tanga um, building blocks because if it doesn't happen at our level, it doesn't happen. That's the, the simple truth of it. So it's really important that we build into our practices the self-belief and the value system and the tikanga around what it means. What does it mean to believe in mana to exercise mana in, in positive ways that keep us well. And there are some simple things that many of us know, but there are a lot of Māori who don't know these things or who don't experience them as uh, practices that keep you well, right? Because I've had very, very different experiences. When our tikanga is practised at its best, um, and when we are, are our best selves in those practices, all right, there's nothing to me that holds us back. So just moving on, I do want to spend um, a little time really just thinking about, I've used the two terms, rangatiratanga and mana motuhake. Our research draws heavily upon Māori concepts, Māori language, um, and, and ideas as expressed in te reo. 
All right, Kopa for Māori research in itself draws on principles that identify key elements that we always think we should address. So the concept of whānau, for example, is a really important um, concept in the way we think about research. It has to reach down, even if it's a, you know, an abstract idea, into this kind of understanding about who we are and um, as a people, where we've been, where we've come from, um, the diversity of who we are, the complexity of who we are, the joy of who we are, um, the challenges of who we are, all of those things are really important. And those principles, I'm not going to go into them today. You can look them up online, uh, Kopa for Māori Research Principles, um, as identified in the beginning by Graham Smith. But one of the reasons we also use these principles in our research or these terms is our kaikōrero, or our participants, bring those, those concepts up. So it's a reflection of what they're telling us. Um, it's a reflection of the way they express their ideas. Um, and it's also, I think, a real reflection of the depth and breadth of knowledge that still exists, mātauranga, that still exists in, in our people and particularly in our practitioners um, and our key informants who we interviewed for this research. So every word has a kind of whakapapa when we're thinking about it um, used in in written form or used in research or used in policies, for example, they come from somewhere and they're often related to other principles. And for us, the term rangatiratanga, we use that term, but it is um, framed by the term tino rangatiratanga in te tiriti o waitangi. And I think there's a couple of ways we think about that term one in relation to what I've just spoken about, our self-belief, our ability and our ability to transform our own lives um, within the constraints that we work in, to believe in ourselves, to claim our sovereignty, right, to not, or to claim our rangatiratanga, that we don't have to be given permission to claim that we have it, we have it. We're born with it, um, and we have to, there are many times when we have to assert it, uh, defend it, protect it, and speak to it. Um, and I think we're, we're reaching just another moment uh, in time where we have to do that. So it's reference to Tiriti, Te Tiriti o Waitangi. The term sovereignty is not really a translation. There is no real English word translation uh, for Aureo, but some of the terms that are used that approximate uh, what, it, what it aspires, what it reflects, is the fact that we can govern ourselves, have a right to govern ourselves. We can be our own governors that we can be self-determining, we have a right to self-determination, we have a right in a sort of sense of sovereignty um, to be sovereign over our own lands and resources, our people and other people who live in our lands. All right, so it's a comprehensive term that means more than one idea in the English language. It also speaks, I think, to, you know, I think one of the ways, one of the reasons that we and others use this term is it's the, it's a structural window to uh, seeking redress, dialogue, transformation uh, in our relationship with the Crown because it appears in Te Tiriti. It appears, it has a history now in the Waitangi Tribunal and the way it's been interpreted and the principle of rangatiratanga, um, all the multiple 
uses and contexts in which Rangatira Tanga has been used gives us this language for being able to engage with um, the Crown and therefore seek sort of these structural opportunities to create change, to change um, our circumstances, to change policy, um, you know, ultimately it's to change the constitution um, of Aotearoa. Those terms are all very nice as, um, you know, sort of theoretically you think, yeah, they're good, that's what we're on about. But to me they make no sense at all if at our grounded level as Fano and as individuals within Fano, we don't believe in them. We don't try and practice that as best we can. We, you know, there's no um, sort of, what do you call it, perfect way of doing this. Um, but if we don't practice that in ourselves, then it becomes a more and more abstract and distant concept that should the day come when we do get to Nōranga Tiratanga, the truth is we won't really know what to do, right? Because we haven't practised it, because it's just an abstract idea. So it is important, I think, to constantly um, be thinking about practising and working with that concept. But the other one, I think, which is often used um, also, but more and more in Māori contexts, is, is mana motuhake, which probably captures more about um, the social way in which we organise our lives as Māori, the underlying principle and philosophy of our human behaviour and our social and collective behaviour, behavior, right? I think it's a dynamic mana in our, was in our society, was a governing principle, right, mana. Um, but in contemporary society, mana is still at play. It's often interpreted as um, power and control, but it actually means more than that. Everyone is born with mana, and it is this dynamic of you You can add to it, but you can also diminish it. You can add to someone else's, you can also diminish these. You can lose yours um, by the way you behave. So, you know, I know a few people, older people, for whom mana is a really is a significant way they in, interact in the world. That, that, that they see others and interact with others. And it is an interesting concept that is in collective because you can't really give yourself a whole lot of mana without, you know, others bestowing that on you, others as a collective. It's a collective concept, even though you're born with this little seed of, um, like a starter kit, you get a starter kit of mana um, because all individual humans have that. Um, and you can, you know, build it or you can keep it locked in tight so that it never develops, it never learns and it never grows and it never interacts with the wider um, collective. One of the reasons it's used, I think, is because that's a term, mana motuhake, that's completely within our control, within Māori control. It's not controlled by a treaty discourse. It's not framed by te tiriti o waitangi and that sort of um, idea. It is, like many of our um, tikanga, controlled, defined um, and used by our people for in whatever circumstances they want to use it. So while they have similar sorts of meanings, one actually does invoke, I think, uh, um, this relationship with with the crown through Te Tiriti o Waitangi. 
and one is our own social and cultural dynamic um, that is about how we interact with ourselves. So I'll take a little breather here. Um, these photos, they're all group photos, um, and they but they share in common. Some of you might be able to work this out. Um, I guess we would describe ourselves as the remnants, um, those who are still here from Nga Tamatoa. And there's three photos. There's one taken at Waipapa, um, University of Auckland Marae, at uh, one of our many um, attempts to organise ourselves, which I know people think Ngā Tamatō were really good at organising things. Uh, we were in some situations, uh, but I think we also drove a lot of people nuts. Many of our members have died, um, and so that's why we're, we're, the, we're the ones that have been left. One of the other image on the right is on of Hana um, Tehemara, who's that image is in Taranaki, and we were there um, to celebrate the unveiling of that image uh, last year. And you will also see then the bottom uh, photo um, of some of us. And the reason I've chosen these is when I've had them, uh, but also, in a way, every generation has had to fight for, struggle for, defend <clears throat> our rangatiratanga, right, since um, the Treaty of Waitangi, Te Tiriti of Waitangi was signed. And, um, and so there's this responsibility that comes with the, the weight of um, these ideas. And how we do that, I think, is very dependent on context. So Ngā Tamatō, for those of you who don't know, was uh, considered a radical Māori protest group that was active for about 10 years in the 1970s. And one of our um, foci, focus uh, of our protest was around the restoration of Te Tiriti o Waitangi and um, of our language, of our reo. Um, we, along with the Te Reo Māori Society in Wellington, um, developed and generated the Te Reo Māori language petition. Uh, but we did a number of other things to disrupt the... I guess discourses and dynamics of the time of the 1970s in which really, you know, Māori was still seen as um, second-class citizens, still subject to huge uh, racism. The Tiriti was not recognised as um, having meaning or standing. Uh, it was definitely not seen as a relationship document with the Crown. It was seen as a sort of historical um, artefact that was that was irrelevant. Um, so, you know, Ngā Tamato and the other radical groups of the time did the work that they needed to do to disrupt that. But we're in a different time and a different context we need different kinds of radicals and different kinds of um, tools to, to do the disruption that I think we need. So just moving on now, just to think about the word decolonizing and decolonization. So firstly, one is the verb, right, decolonizing. It's the more active um, idea, and the other one, decolonization is the noun that names a thing. I do know those uh, words are used a lot. I, I, sometimes I don't know what uh, people think they mean. 
Um, but I think it's very much uh, grounded in a, in a particular set of structural, historical, political, um, economic, social circumstances that we really um, have to resist and have to decolonize ourselves from. And if you look at all the theories, all the work that's been done around the impact of colonization on our lives, what that research tells us from all around the world, right, um, is that European colonization, but in our particular case, British forms of colonization destroyed lives. It destroyed systems, our cultural systems, our social systems, destroyed our structures. It destroyed our belief systems. It destroyed our language. It destroyed our relationship to our land, for example, uh, to our waterways. It was it crept on us. It wasn't just about legislation. It wasn't just about um, battles and warfare. That there are elements of um, colonization which are part of this, what is, what is known more in the literature really as this cultural system of colonialism, which was, which was a system people weren't, it was invisible in a way was hidden in knowledge, was hidden in literature, was hidden in language, in discourses, in um, religion. So at one level, all these things seem to be innocent. Um, they weren't what we were necessarily suffering from. We, we are, you know, our people understood the legislation. The people understood to open up to. Um, the impact of that. But there are all these other things that seem to be benign, right, seem to be more palatable, that easier to accept, but were just as harmful. And because they've managed to, I think Ngugi Wa Theongo is one Nigerian theorist who's written about, you know, decolonizing the mind is trying to understand the depth at which colonization has actually changed our way of knowing, our way of thinking, and therefore our way of being. So we think of colonization as having that impact, then thinking about decolonizing and the goal of decolonization, which is the goal, um, requires us to address all these dimensions. In a previous, in our previous research in Oranga Ngako, in that um, research that we did, we kind of identified um, a range of what we call determinants to. Um, you know, the determinants of negative health, the things that were really had a terrible impact on us, which is really we could break down um, colonization to those sorts of levels. And I just I haven't got a slide on that, so I'll, I'll try and take it sort of slowly. But you know, most people when talking about colonization. Uh, are thinking really about the history, the historical impact. And that impact was very large scale, right? It hit our population really, really hard. Like we nearly died out as a people. That's how impactful it was. We were dispossessed from our lands. Um, we were subject to severe traumatic events and to colonial violence. Um, the bringing in of British forces that fought in India um, into New Zealand to help settlers 
you know, invade the Waikato and invade and move further south before the settler governments establish their own constabulary. So that's often the picture of colonisation that a lot of um, other New Zealanders hold, right? It's something that happened in the past. It was this historical stuff, you know, it, it happened so long ago, um, it's over. That's generally what they're using, That, but the definition they're using when they think about that. But let me put it another way to you. If I think of my whānau, uh, my grandmother, I think she lived till she was 98, this on my mum's side. My great-grandmother, uh, she lived, well, two years of my great-grandmothers lived well over the, the, their hundreds. They were over 100 when they um, died. So my um, the stories that I heard the stories that my mum heard, the stories that her mum heard were stories that were experienced by their grandmother. Like within our living memory, our great-great-great-great-grandmother lived through that, our great-great-great-grandmother, our great-great-grandmother, our great-grandmother, our great-great-grandmother and our grandmother, sorry, all those different steps. If you think about it like that in terms of your own whānau, you can identify how far back and what they experienced. If you put it like that, it is within our living memory because those memories are not that far ago. They're not that long ago. And why do I say that? I've got five generations of my whānau alive now. You can learn from five generations. Um, so we can live in the moment as five generations. So just kind of spend some time thinking about that. Then think about who your tipuna was when the Tiriti was signed, who your tipuna was um, 20 years after Tiriti, who your tipuna was in the 1900s, the 1920s, the 1950s, etc. It's not that long ago. All right, so so that's the bit that people often think, oh, you know, it's all over now, you should forget it. Well, we can't, because on top of that were these other things. So there was another level of determinants, which is really when state policy and practice determinants kicked in. This is when um, policies were applied, which caused... Um, enormous negative impact on us. Things like exclusion, social exclusion, the introduction of eugenics and scientific racism, the introduction of patriarchy and paternalism and misogyny, um, separatist policies that were developed by the New Zealand government um, to really push Māori not only off our lands, uh, but really into the hinterlands, the margins um, of New Zealand, out of sight, out and this out of the way was the main part of it. So that's another layer that came on top. Um, you know, once the New Zealand government um, assumed greater and control, really after the New Zealand Settlements Act in the eighteen seventies, then there's another layer of determinants, which we've called intergenerational determinants. And really these determinants begin to speak to this cumulative loss, this intergenerational loss, cultural assimilation, economic deprivation, social and cultural alienation, um, what's often called cognitive injustice, the destruction of our knowledge systems, very deliberate, right, very deliberate, ridiculing what we knew, ridiculing um, and excluding our own language, our own ways of knowing the world. But even things like food, the, the changing of diets, the introduction of really a terrible Western European diet, 
that has had long-standing negative impacts down through the generations. That, you know, so I guess what I'm talking about when I understand both colonization and then the decolonization, the decolonizing, what we have to do, I see it as this kind of multi-leveled or multi-layered sets of um, determinants that we have to unpack, understand, and transform, change. You know, we get into the 1980s, we're into sort of neoliberal determinants and the market model and the sort of punitive use of state power to punish, right, the use of state power to punish beneficiaries, to humiliate uh, people who are unemployed, right, to, to sort of replace um, an ideology about, you know, people not doing well in school uh, to people who don't deserve the benefits of society uh, because they didn't try hard enough. So these different uh, determinants also impact then internally. Um, this is the piece we don't like talking about, but they have an impact on our own internal um, dynamics. Uh, the, there was the piece about colonialism, which is about the destruction, um, theft, in a way, of our knowledge, of our culture. But there's also the way in which we chose to protect that by silencing it ourselves, by erasing some of it ourselves, um, by choosing not to remember it. You know, these are all strategies. But there are also issues around lateral violence, okay, a ban, which starts to get to this kaupapa about the way we mirror what we're experiencing from colonisation into our own social context. <coughs> Bringing that down <coughs> to our own family. Bringing that down. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just got a bit of a cough. <coughs> um, so internal colonialism starts to get to how we then reproduce colonial violence within our own society and within our own pharma. And then that brings us to social determinants. So I'm sorry for the sort of the heavy, complex sort of layering, but really what I want to um, demonstrate is it's not this thing from the past. It's something that is continuing and that it is deeply embedded in who we are now. Um, and there are things that we've done and we've chosen to do because, the, because our people have had to survive, right? They've had to make ch choices to survive. And some of those choices now we think, or why didn't you speak to me in te reo? You know, we ask those questions. But then if we look at the, the world they lived in, the decision that generation were making is, we want you to live. And so one way to help you live is to encourage you to learn English. And the best way we know how to do that is to not speak to do to you. So every generation is trying to survive, trying to be kind to the next generation, trying to protect, trying to love. And in the process of doing that, we also begin to colonize ourselves, right? To limit ourselves. And that's why <clears throat> we lose hope and we lose belief in what we're doing. So just to kind of summarize this slide, when I think about decolonizing, there's two main processes. One is the dismantling of these systems and structures that impact on our lives, right? That's the pulling it down piece, getting, getting rid of it piece, changing it, 
put in a Tibet piece. But then there's another piece, and that's the creative one. That's creating, implementing, replacing systems and structures that help us move forward. And this is where our knowledge, our mātauranga, our tikanga that we still have becomes this amazing, inspiring resource because it is a source of our creativity. It is what helps us develop these new systems. What do I mean by a new system? Well, kohanga reo is a new system, right? It was created because of a loss of language. And it was created on principles of Fano, reinstating this beautiful idea of a Fano being in a nest, being nested, all right, being loved and embraced in an intergenerational space so they could be immersed in their language and culture. That's a modern institution that's a direct response to colonialism. So we could think about that as a decolonizing action, decolonizing strategy on the creative side, right? It works in a number of levels. It works because it begins to nourish, to revitalize, right? To um, restore elements of our culture. But one of the things I know we learned in Kohanga and Kura, and we actually had to have a discussion about this at a whānau, we I remember, is we were, you know, busy um, embracing our tamariki and all sorts of aroha and all sorts of real, but they experienced this racist incident in a playground and their reactions to it were um, kind of shocking for, for us as parents because they didn't know how to handle it. And so then we had to ask ourselves, do we have to teach them how to handle racism? Do we have to teach them this stuff? So this is the other side of decolonizing. Right? How do we also learn to defend ourselves? How do we learn to take these things apart, to target racism as a system, as a structure that has to be dismantled? All right, so that's, that's how these two work together. We need both. Um, if all you did was dismantle, then you wouldn't build the things that we need. And if all you did was build the things you think we need, they may not help us to address these other things that we need. So I'm, I'm going to park that there, and I'm going to move just to another slide of images. Um, and really, I think these just speak to work we've all been involved in, uh, members, different members of our research team over the years. The Aura book is our most recent one from the, the study I've just been referring to, right? So in that book uh, is the piece that it is elaborated more around the determinants, the colonial determinants. Uh, but it's also a book around healing from trauma. Um, the Ngākura Māori book really is, is, is just... Um, we did this a number of years ago that just looked at the way the kura system, the native school system was established and the ways in which it became a tool of cultural assimilation. All the sort of ins and outs, even though we knew communities and parents were very much trying to resist colonialism, remember they were also trying to survive and trying to do their best. So in this book are sort of lots of um, oral histories about people's experiences. Now, obviously, there were those who were beaten for speaking to real. There were those who were excluded for speaking to real. Uh, but there are also examples where teachers, Pākehā teachers, 
became very fluent in te reo, uh, where a lot of children loved going to their kura. They, they, um, they were because they were going with their cousins, right? Um, they were going and learning alongside everyone else in their valley or in their hapu. So these kura over time became quite um, Māori institutions. They often had Māori principals. My my parents, for example, uh, were teachers in uh, the Māori school system. It changed its name after World War II to the Māori school system. But it was set up as a separate school system in 1867. I think about this. Te Tiriti was signed in 1840. The act, the legislation that confiscated lands occurred in 1871. So before that, the native school system was set up and the native land court was set up. So those institutions were all created in the same decade. And you can begin to see the way... Um, the state and the way legislation started to like take land, give us a little school, if I could put it like that, you know, uh, completely destroy um, homes and lives and then, you know, create a different model, for example, and individualizing land titles. So taking most of our land and then giving it back. Uh, with 10 owners uh, or giving it back in, in a way that in the end people couldn't sustain that land. So all of this was occurring at the same time. And then the other book on the left, the decolonizing book, um, really this is the third edition. Some of you might be familiar with the blue one, which is the first edition, and then there was a um, pink one, that was the second edition and the third one. People asked me, you know, oh, is that you on the cover of the first edition? And I say, no, I had no choice about the cover. And then my mother said when she saw the pink edition, which had a footprint like this, is that your foot? I said, no, mum, that's not my foot. Well, why'd they put that foot on it? Um, so it's not my foot. It's it just happens to be um, the cover of the book, and I quite like the colour. Okay, moving on. Oh, that's right, I gave us a cloud picture to reflect on as well. Because I know this stuff is heavy. I don't know what it's like where you live. Um, it's a little bit of a cloudy day here. Um, but the clouds are good to look at. Right? Yeah. All right, I'm going to move through some quotes now um, from some of our kai kōrero. Um, I'll read them, even though I know some of you could see them. My interpretation of what's been going on in the last 20 years of my career in mental health, it's pretty soul-destroying, frankly, because you set things up you think you've made some traction, you're doing some good, and then there's a change in policy. And they just shut down Māori services, and they close down Māori units, Māori parts of ministries even. We're still so vulnerable to the vagaries of the particular political environment. So we need to be in control of the money of our own self-determined entities as we determine them to be. We need all of that to be devolved to us. All right, so what we're beginning to get in, in these quotes from our kai kōrero are the search for the solutions. And it's pretty clear that, you know, at the system level, uh, many of our kai kōrero saw um, this devolution of power and resources to our entities, to us, in, a, in essence, because of this 
volatile, or as she called it or he called it, the vagaries, the fact that they're constantly changing, constantly threatening to um, tear down what has been built. And it's one of the reasons I think Māori just don't trust the Crown, right? Because a window opens, you think things are, they're never perfect, but the the opportunity widens, the window widens, and then there's an election, change of government, boom, you know, back to basics. And really, I think that speaks to the here and now. Just another piece to reflect on. From another Kai Kōnero, what needs to be done so that all our whānau are supported to thrive and flourish in Aotearoa? The government needs to honour Te Tiriti o Waitangi for a starter. Might be a good place to start. And, every, and in everything that they do, in our education system, in our health system, in our justice system, Māori need to be at the table making those decisions. I don't actually think they should be making decisions alongside Pākehā because your fellow's way hasn't been working for a long time. Let us, let us come up with the solutions. You know, so once again, it's really penetrating the system stuff uh, where our kaikōrero saw the solutions. It's not just changing the practice at the interface, all right, where, um, where whānau violence has been experienced. The way to prevent whānau violence, right, the preventative component has to occur way back in system change. Why? Because I think what you've heard already to date and what you'll hear um, next week is the system itself is violent. It reproduces violence. And you've got to ask whether the system that is violent can actually address violence. I think that's the legitimacy question that is often asked around whether the state can address violence in society and the kind of violence that our people experience. It loses legitimacy in that space when it too is violent to our people. Here's another quote. Just off the top of my head, there would be specific cultural ways. Look, on a marae, those environments where a lot of the addressing of domestic violence is done in an office or a building way off the ground. Our whenua, our papatuanuku, has always been nurturing and nourishing our everyday activities, and it shouldn't be any different. We should be doing those same things by way of using specific cultural ways of dealing with farmo, going back to our traditional ways, no laws or courts from the Toiwi side. We need to look at our customary rights to be able to address our own behaviours and in our own way, in our own environment, with those that absolutely have the teachings to be able to influence those who need to change their behaviour. All right, so when we're thinking about the solutions, really what you know and what um, is affirmed in our research is many of the solutions are already known and have been posed and requested for decades, all right? Um, and if anything, people haven't stopped asking for these things. They've become more certain that these are where the solutions lie. And, you know, there's more research that suggests that this is absolutely where the solutions lie, right? In, in honouring, in 
developing a Tariti or Waitangi um, constitutional government of New Zealand and decolonizing society and addressing racism and addressing the social and cultural determinants of health, right? The things like housing, employment, or poverty, addressing basic rights and needs of human beings, right? Some of the three, the three most powerful needs of humans, food, shelter, security. We ask ourselves, how many Māori have those? Have shelter, have food, have security. When we're talking about whānau violence or the violence, the violence we experience in our communities, you know, much of this is a reflection of a lack of security. We have no security. You, you cannot live if you're not safe in your own, under your own roof. You cannot live if you have no roof. And you certainly can't live if you have no shelter and no food and no sense of security. So that's a basic human right, okay? And here we are in 2023 saying we need to address basic human rights. But we also need um, to implement these healthy, what are called symmetrical partnerships. So you would have heard the term treaty partnerships, but treaty partnerships are asymmetrical. They're unequal. One partner has more power and more money, more might, than the other partner. And, and that's the concept of symmetrical then is they're not they're not equal in terms of how they fit together. So we need more symmetrical partnerships where really power is equally shared, resources are equally shared, decisions are equally made. And then, of course, there's the restore, honour and apply Māori cultural principles and practices. If we go back in the literature, this has been argued for decades as well. And increasingly, the models of Māori cultural principles and practices have become much more sophisticated, are much more known. And we have practitioners who train actually are trained in these principles. So we're not talking about abstract um, ideas that have, you know, that we're sort of trying to figure out how they work, really talking about cultural principles that we know work. And I'm, yes, so I want to get to this slide, which is essentially my last slide. Um, and these materials that the wheels come from Tutama Wahine, who are really great at producing cool resources that are practical, that Fano can use. And in the case of the wheels, you can stick on your fridge. So one is around um, Te Tiriti o Waitangi, a Kopapa Māori way of, um, in relation to Tiriti o Waitangi. There are the Kopapa Māori principles in that wheel on the left. And then this middle wheel is, um, you know, in relation to healing, Kopapa Māori and healing. And if you just, it's not very clear maybe to you, but it's it addresses some of the principles that we identified in our earlier research. And this is what I mean when I say we already have these cultural principles. Organisations and uh, communities have been developing them into really practice models, clinical models for working um, at the interface when they're working with clients, but they are also principles for engaging with power, engaging with institutions, right? They are a way of organizing your ideas so that we don't go in just for what's called the low-hanging fruit um, in a negotiation. 
We're trying to get to the systemic um, opportunities that can unleash um, systemic change. And we have to operate that on all levels. The chart on the right is another way of expressing Kopa Pamari principles in relation to healing from trauma. So just before I finish, I just want to address the political future that we're going into in the next few weeks, because I know a lot of people are feeling really depressed um, about what's going to happen. And if I let myself be depressed, I would be too. But um, I know we've been here before, right? And I know when we were here before in this place, in, in a place which seemed overwhelming and depressing, we, we had the power to fight back, and we did. I know that through all the dark years after Te Tiriti Waiting, Waitangi was signed, our people continued to believe that Te Tiriti Waitangi was an important document and was one that we signed, our tipuna signed in good faith, and that it is the mechanism for solutions for, for our experiences today. I know there was a time when people thought that our real was going to disappear, that it became pointless, that they could see marae, where there was, where a tangi, for example, was held entirely in English. And I know that motivated them to get into the work of revitalizing our real. I know when I was in a parent of a young baby, you know, and we had to go and ask the Māori Affairs Department at the time, I think, whether we could get a grant uh, to start our kohanga reo. What was on offer was $5,000. And in this room were uh, Māori social workers who wanted $5,000 to develop a program to keep children from glue sniffing. There were others who wanted $5,000 to um, ensure that our children weren't living under bridges in Auckland City, that there were all these groups and all of us were there to compete for $5,000. And all of us recognised how demeaning and unfair and unjust that was, right? But I also know that Māori can act in ways that are mana-driven. And we were the most unlikely group when you think of all those needs because we just had these babies and we just said to them, we believe if we could have a kōhanga, we can create a generation who don't live under bridges who are not going to sniff glue because they're going to be different kind of babies. What do you think we got? All right. So what that group did, they yep, they divided up the money amongst, you know, little bits of money for everyone, and we got the bulk of it. And that's that's other Māori displaying mana, right? as a practice of mana and a belief that actually we do have to invest in the future. We do have to um, believe that there are things that we can do that will make life better for future generations. So don't give up heart. Um, we just have to continue to sing our beautiful songs like I've just heard this week uh, with our um, kapahaka of our young tamariki, how would we have got that without all the work that went in, you know, went in beforehand? And what is that generation um, going into and going to face? 
we're stronger because of them, right? We're stronger because of the work that's been done. So we're not starting way back 50 years ago. We're just simply having to change our tactics, change our strategies, um, persist, continue to defend, continue to protect, do the best that um, we can, and give mana where mana is due. And remind ourselves often, when Māori are abandoned, as what happened during COVID, and some of the in the early days of COVID, what did Māori do? All right, we looked after ourselves. That's Rangatiratanga. The means, the belief, the opportunity, and the sense of obligation to do that. That's all to me, that sort of belief in Rangatiratanga. It is within us to do it, so do it. And that's really where I'm going to finish. You know, Queen, it defines And I think about probably the many decades of your career and your life, and then thinking about your grandmother's grandmothers, and those, as you say, that it's actually quite a short time when we think about linking it down. Um, to the lived memories of our grandparents and, and their lived memories as well. Um, some might see us as disheartened, but I see um the <clears throat> I see the the modi, the strong modi within you and everything that you've done um and probably what you will continue to do <laughs> because there's no such thing as retirement. Anyway, um I just have a, a part I about that Philinda. You showed a photo now, some people who might be on, on the call might not have even realised that you were a member of Ngā Tamatoa. Does the action or the strategies that we employ change over the course of one's life? And what are the strategies that a researcher can take on uh, to, to have a very powerful um, voice and you know, was it the pen is power, more powerful than the sword? What are your thoughts on that, Fire? Um, well, I think when you're young, you, you think you can change things like tomorrow um, and can be disruptive in the sense that in the end, older, the older generation forgives you for your youthfulness. It's a bit more difficult as you age where they think you haven't learned anything. Um, but I, you know, I was a student when I was in Ngā Tamatoa. I was interested in the issues already of uh, colonialism and colonisation. But I also thought if you don't, um, if you just stand aside and do nothing, then you're really part of the process of continuing colonization. That, you know, you have to do the things that um, suit you, that they drive you, if you like, that you know you've got a talent for, you've got to pursue that. Um, to do, you know, maybe that work is maybe not obvious to people, a uh, little bit more, um, you know, ivory towerish, if you like. But that was my groove, and really that's the way I've chosen in my life to try and um, create change and to support um, our aspirations for Tenoranga Teratanga, but also try to understand it because I think knowledge is powerful, um, and I think I've had the privilege of being able to look at things in terms of having the time to, being paid to, um, think about these ideas in quite deep ways and not when I'm on the hof, on the, you know, on the run all the time um, and be able to develop my knowledge of those, you know, over years and years of thinking about, reading about and doing research on. Well, absolutely. 
Well, Lena, I think about your um your poker poker decolonizing methodologies, uh, and I sort of think once you commit it to to the kupu to to the pen or to to the to the typing, then other people can't, you know, um, you're there, you know, you're creating the narrative, you're creating the center, um, for their wananga or their reaction, but um, without um, strong writers like yourself um, to inspire the next generations or or even those who are older than you, um, uh, you know, there's a vacuum. So te nei te mihi ki a koe. Last week, Fire, you, um, you said that there was a need to amplify the hearing of those who need to, to listen. You know, we talk about amplifying voices, but you said we need to amplify the hearing of those who need to listen. So... Um, and that thought, you know, what can Farno do in government policy institutions um, where they have influence, um, but they're still within a violent um, system? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, they've been Māori in public policy for years as well, decades um, as well, and some of them have um, survived a long, a long time, but but they become a little bit more hidden and a little bit less uh, assertive, I think, about Māori concepts. It's not always a safe environment for Māori, and that's what I understand, and it um, can be very toxic in particular ministries. And when you have a minority uh, opinion or view, and I wouldn't even call it an opinion because... Um, it's an informed view based on research. It's why we do research, is to put it in the hands of policy people so that they have something substantial that they can use, you know, so it's not just them expressing an opinion, um, that they can still have the courage to put uh, our ideas through and to put... Um, good policy for Māori through and to defend some of the initiatives that they've already started. Um, so, for example, Te Aurere Kura, the strategy, you know, for it to sit in the, on a table and not be continued to be acted upon would be just, like, terrible. It's like you do all this work, people invest all this work, and then there's a change and it's like, oh, it's irrelevant. It is never irrelevant. You know, it still has to be pushed through. Um, and sometimes it's about coming from the ground up. Other times it's about coming in sideways. And re where research can be powerful is we know policy people have to read the latest research. We know that research can um, influence policy because it, it is data, right? It's the data that they need. But we need more and more of it. We need to have overwhelming data. It needs to be, you know, powerful. We need others to be citing it, to be using it. And we need the people who are impacted um, by violence in society and violence um, as we experience it to be constantly pushing for Kaupapa Māori solutions. Because if we don't do that, you know the kinds of solutions that will be provided. It's already pretty clear in the uh, party manifestos that, you know, we're going to need more prisons, for example. All the research tells us that does not provide a solution. That just traumatises a whole lot of other people who are going to come out um, and not be able you know, not be able to live good lives or to help their whanau live good lives. Um, that's the that's the frustrating piece, I think, about politics and about um, a shift to, not just to the right, I mean, I'd say a shift to the right would be a shift towards national and then the libertarian right, which is ACT. But when you put in a mix of New Zealand First Act, National, and inside that um, a definite 
strand of white supremacy, you know, that then becomes quite a potent mix. I don't know how it's going to pan out. Um, I've got quite a few friends and colleagues in the public service. Um, I'm sort of, they've said to me, do you think I should stay or get a job, get another job? And I'm thinking, well, I think you should stay. It's not going to be very good, but if you go, where do we, you know, who do we, um, who will be there for us? Who will be there for our whānau? Hi, thank you, Fyland. There, there was um, some comments of support in the question and answers, um, and also um, a, a question around the the role of Waitangi Tribunal as a strategy for Māori to raise issues of state violence. Um, you know, we know that there's the, the Wahine um, uh, claim uh, as well. Is the research that Hiwaka Ekenoa represents um, uh, uh, being utilised in some of those claims? Oh, I'm, I'm sure uh, it will <laughs> come through uh, along with the other report. It's definitely, you know, um, there's definitely an appetite for this research. We need the evidence all the time. As someone who's on the tribunal, as you know, I'm on the health haura inquiry and I'm on the manawahine inquiry. Um, we listen to the testimonies of witnesses or their affidavits, uh, but we also read research. And it is fabulous in the Howard inquiry in particular to have read all the research from Māori researchers. It's been incredibly powerful. Why? Because Māori researchers ask the questions that need to be answered that impact on Māori health lives, right? Māori health researchers have been doing research on, say, racism in health um, since the Edu Poor Māori Centre uh, in Wellington at Victoria. Um, at Otago in Wellington Clinical School, started with Paparangi Reed. That research over time now has, you know, made a really powerful impact in the Waitangi Tribunal. If they didn't do it, you know, you've got to ask yourself, would mainstream researchers have focused on that question? So what Māori researchers do is ask the questions that Māori people need to be asked to address our issues, right? right? And we do it in a way that elicits the answers that we need. You know, how you frame a question is, uh, is really critical to the kind of answers you're going to get. So if you frame it one way, you can exclude a whole lot of types of answers. If you frame it another way, you can open up a window. And, oh. um, you know, a lot of kaupapa Māori research is about trying to open up answers to people who really know and experience our cultural ways and our ways of living now. Right. Well, we've got, um, we're just a little bit over time, but there is a question I'd like to, to pose to you with this premise. This is from Whare Kupinga Keith. Um, the turmoil for Kaimahi is the transient and permanent nature of government spaces and infrastructure. One has to immerse oneself in Whakapapa and Pūrāko to stabilise, and it's difficult to identify those spaces collectively. The Pātai is, in your research, who is the Ngā Tamatoa of social workers, and how do you become a member? <laughs> Oh, what a fabulous question. But I'm not a social worker, so I'd, I'd like to think most Māori social workers are warriors, ngā tamatoa, um, in the social work world. But I know social work training and practice has changed over the years as well and has turned a lot of social work practice into, um, in my theoretical language, I'd call it sort of performativity a type of neoliberal performativity where you focus on certain sort of tick the box exercises and don't fuss about, you know, the need to really address 
the significant social issues our people are experiencing. And that's why policy is important, right? Because that's what sets the uh, parameters of, in which social workers have license to do their work. We can all be Ngāt Tamatō because Ngāt Tamatō was a, look, honestly, we were a mix of 19 to 26 year olds. Um, we had multiple skills. Not all of us uh, liked to protest. Uh, some of us were much more organized, were able to plan logistics and ensure that, you know, there was food delivered to certain sorts of places. Uh, we actually knew you had to approach a marae committee to book a marae and you can just turn up. Um, so, so there's all kinds of skills to mount a campaign. You need leadership. You need a vision that you all kind of agree on and you all definitely agree you're going to work on. You need a range of skill sets. You need people in the front who are going to take a lot of the um, crap, really. But you also need people in the back who have your backs. And, you know, if you look at any Māori protest, there's the spontaneous thing that happens that the media gets excited about. But that's not sustainable unless it's driven from something much more deeper and um, with, with a whole lot of support behind it. Now, that is a very whānau approach to anything, right? We That's how whānau do stuff um, as a collective. If you operate as a collective, you need all those elements and mm -hmm. they all need to be in harmony and that's why leadership is important um that's also why knowing what you're about is important uh that's not you know being being able to exercise compassion aroha whatever you call it all those things become important we can all do that all of us can do that thank you thank you um uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I see that um, it's quite an interesting uh, ahuatanga to to me rongo, you know, to rongo and actively um, attempt to maintain a tupuna message like to fitia tōu um, mm -hmm. And the question of how do you protect self? Um, how I think you said the how do we learn to defend ourselves, but still be um, uh, uh, in permission um, to receive energy, but also to to release it using um, the only use the kupu release this morning. I just want to make to you for your legacy. Uh, and your ability to inspire others. And I don't know, what can you tell us? One self-protection or um, self-care strategy that you use for yourself to maintain the ability to, to see beyond um, all of the difficulty and look to a vision? I don't take myself super seriously. Um, I I always know where I came from, and I always know who my whānau are. I have a fabulous whānau. I come home and there's two crayfish, two coda. Um, you know, so I'm kind of happy to cook our kai and um, catch up with, you know, um, today I had lunch with uh, my sister-in-law, Cheryl, and my husband, Graham, and we were able to just chill out and catch up on what's happened over the last week. Simple things um, I value. I've always had a good sense of where I'm from. Uh, my grandmother, I think from a very young age, the Ngā my Ngāti pro grandmother, from a very young age, she used to say to me, Young Pro. Like she would not acknowledge all my other iwi. Wherever you go in the world, Young Pro. 
and she just drummed that into me. Um, and, I, and I think my sister as well, that we, and it used to sing in our ears, her message. And I never really knew what that meant until I left home and started to travel. And then I started to meet people who can't say that with that level of deep, you know, confidence and um, wiring. You know, we were wired into that as an identity. And so it's, yeah, it's unapologetic. Um, but it's what keeps me kind of grounded. Right. We have over 50 people who are still with us 15 wow. minutes after we were supposed to. On a to Friday finish. afternoon. So I just mm -hmm. want to mahi to you, um, uh, by Linda, for your kōrero today. Uh, this recording, your generosity to enable this kōrero to be recorded and uploaded um, onto to the Tutama Wahine website for people to share um, means that people will go back to it and listen to it over and over again. Um, thank you so much. Looking forward to the research being released in December um, and also looking forward to the next adventures and the next decade of activism. You use the word radical. I think that's crack up because I think our rangatahi wouldn't even know the, the bars or barbs that was thrown at you in our tamatoa as being radical. Um, and I look forward to their generation coming through with their different expressions mm. of, um, of activism as well. Uh, Next um, Friday at 9am we have our next session with Shirley Simmons from Te Aho Limited and Shirley is going to be talking about um, a national survey on whānau order and pai order. So really looking forward to hearing from her, from Ngaro P. Cameron, uh, from uh, Leone P. Hama and others of our Mare Kura uh, again next Friday. Um, tēnei te mihi kia koutou, kia whakakapi tō tātou hui, i roto i ngā whakarotanga a kui mā a koro mā um, koutou rā kua ko mene atu ki te pō uh, ko i te i o tātou oaini o te te i mat I te i matua ki ke tiraha ana i tēnei wā tonu i runga i ngā marae i ngā kāinga o, o rato taki wā um, haere, haere atu koutou. Ko koutou e noho pauri ana, e noho e pani ana, uh, nui te aroha ki a koutou. Kia taunga manakitanga o te wahingaro ki runga ki tēnā ki tēnā o tātou. Kia mahia te hua mā kiha kiha, kia toi te kupu, toi te mana, toi te reo. Toi te haora, kia tuturu o uti waka maua, kia tīna, tīna, haumie, huie, tāi ki e, tēnā rā tātou.